thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And uh, okay, I'm not a very early riser normally, but uh, Henrik made me give a talk in the very, very early morning because I have to retract four and a half hours. My children had a good laugh when they found out I have to give a talk before 6 a.m. in the morning because I don't normally uh, function very well. Um, I will uh, be giving an experimental uh, uh, thing. Um, and halfway, I will also switch to a little bit of theory because I try to explain to my colleagues uh, the Penrosian wave function collapse. What we do is uh, we work at very low temperatures. This is uh, the inside of our, one of our refrigerators. And this plate becomes uh, 10 millikelv. So it's, uh, uh, every plate is colder than the previous one. This one is 4 Kelvin. And it's cooled by a pulse tube, which is uh, a nasty piece of equipment powered by a compressor that hisses. And <laughs> if you have been in these low temperature labs, you will recognize the sound. But the, the complication is that our experiment will be down here, and it, it suffers from the mechanical noise and, and the acoustic noise that is generated by this compressor. But the nice thing about these new pulse tube powered dilution refrigerators is that you have a lot of space. It's really this much space that it's all at 10 millikelv. So you can do quite complex experiments. Um, the experiments that we do, um, they are uh, a force sensor with a magnet at the bottom. And this magnet we then use to detect uh, spins. Ideally, we would like to detect a single uh, proton spin. Um, and, and this is to, to do imaging. Um, and that brings me to the measurement apparatus. So this is the, say, the classical piece of measurement apparatus. It is uh, uh, to measure a current, so you, you you have two wires, you connect the, it into a circuit, and then this uh, lever will deflect to the right if the current is positive, it will turn to the left if it, the current is negative. And we know what's inside, we build our own e experiments. So I would like to know what is so special about a, um, a, a, a measurement apparatus that it only gives one answer to the question, what is the current? We know certain uh, devices like uh, a squid will have two counter rotating currents at the same time. And if we would try to measure this current, um, do we measure a single or do we measure two displacements of this mechanical resonator? And uh, Cleland and Martinez, they uh, published in 2010 a mechanical resonator. This one, it doesn't really bend like this, but it, it goes opening or it ex ex expands and shrinks. It's a piezoelectric piece of material coupled to a superconducting quantum bit. So uh, um, a squid that can have these counter-rotating. Um, actually, this was a superconducting charge uh, to this. Um, so it is possible to have a mechanical thing do two things at the same time. And um, the question is, why then is uh, what is special about a, about a piece of measurement equipment? Is it because it's large? Is it because uh, the displacements are much larger than in this Martinez experiment? Here, uh, the displacements were really, really very, very small. Um, so, and the way I pose this theoretically is we know the density matrix uh, uh, Formalism, where you take uh, this product of two uh, wave functions, wave vectors, and then if you have a lot of microscopic degrees of freedom, say the, the, the environment, which uh, makes coherences go away, you end up with a diagonal matrix. So that is how I used to understand the quantum measurement problem. If the decoherence is such that these off-diagonal matrix uh, elements are zero, then that is the equivalent of a measurement. But that's actually not really what my problem is. My problem is that after a while, this di diagonal matrix becomes uh, a matrix that has zeros everywhere except in one diagonal element. 
And that is when we have one measurement out of it. So the microscopic degrees of freedom that cause decoherence, they only cause the coherences to go away. So we won't have interferometry anymore if we do an experiment. But the real riddle to me is if we have a camera and we send an electron wave towards this camera, there's only one pixel which becomes white and all the other pixels become black. Although the, ele the electron might as well have excited all of the pixels in the camera a little bit. So with this formalism, we can calculate what the probabilities are of the electrons hitting a particular pixel. But the, the question to me is, why is only one pixel active? And can we perhaps predict how large a pixel or a piece of measurement equipment needs to be in order to have this effect? Um, so it's really, can we find a non-unitary element that is now missing in the Schrodinger wave equation approach? Um, and so my approach as an experimentalist is try to think of experiments in which um, we probe this kind of experimental regime. Can we make objects be in two positions or can we, uh, and, and perhaps if we make a very heavy superposition, as mentioned by Marcus, um, and, and, and the way I try to do this, coming from this background of trying to measure um, magnetic resonance with a mechanical object, um, you will see that these experiments uh, uh, have this. Um, towards the end, I will show some of our experimental uh, challenges, of which I already mentioned this vibration problem. Um, these are the people with whom I have been working on magnetic resonance uh, imaging uh, with these mechanical resonators. I would like to mention particularly Andrea, who was here last week. And I'm, I'm sorry we did not have any overlap. And I should mention uh, Tom, who has been here uh, all the time. And, uh, um, I will show this figure again uh, later. So this is what we uh, do for our bread and butter. Um, we have a mechanical resonator, which can actually deflect a little bit. Um, there's a ball attached to it, which is magnetic. It's above a surface that contains spin. And the magnetic field coming from this ball, the field lines go like this. And the temperature is so low, uh, and the magnetic field is sufficiently high for these spins to become uh, polarized. And then we have a little wire uh, running to the side of the experiment. And then if a current oscillates in this wire, we create an oscillating magnetic field. And then the question is, OK, this has a certain frequency. There is a slice in space, because the magnetic field is not constant everywhere, this slice denotes the places where the Larmor condition is fulfilled. So the magnetic field of the tip times uh, the, the gamma that belongs to a particular electron spin. So it, for electrons, it's typically 25 gigahertz per tesla. So at 200 millitesla, we will have 5 gigahertz of current in this wire, and then these spins will become resonant and they will start flipping. And when the spins flip, um, we can detect this as a change in resonance frequency of the mechanical resonator. Here you see how we make these uh, tips. This is a very thin beam of silicon, 200 nanometers uh, thin or so, five micrometers wide, and hundreds of mi micrometers long. Maybe 100, 120, but they are made also at 300 or 400. Um, so then we have uh, our, our force sensor. I call them the IBM cantilevers because they were made by Ben Chui for IBM. And actually, the different postdocs and I had been there as a, as a, on a sabbatical. We put money together, and then he made extra cantilevers for us. So this technique, um, magnetic resonance force microscopy, was pioneered um, at IBM by uh, Daniel Ruger, who was very inviting and welcoming extra people working in the field. Because it's a very difficult technique, and there, I think there are only six or 10 groups in the world working on this. Um, the state of the art uses a laser to do interferometry to measure the displacement of these uh, four sensors. 
Um, and then um, it was possible to detect a single electron spin and do uh, NMR of a virus particle leading to an MRI image at six nanometers resolution. And this technique, it works down to about one Kelvin, maybe a little bit colder. Uh, the 100 millikelvin sometimes would just put the laser very, very uh, low in power. Um, what we uh, do in, in Leiden is we use a, a squid, which is a superconductor that has two weak links in it. And then the magnet is oscillating over a pickup coil. Um, so if the magnet moves, the flux here changes. Because it's a superconductor, the flux is conserved. So then there's flux also here to compensate this flux. And this flux then enters the squid. And the squid is the most sensitive device to measure flux. And that's what we use uh, all the time. The way it works is that if you have no magnetic field in the squid, then the current will divide equally, and this, uh, there's a maximum current that you can send through this. If you do have <coughs> flux, say a little bit of flux here, then there's a, a, sh a shielding current, and then this current is itself, uh, with the added current, will cause this structure to become non-superconducting at a much lower uh, current. So that is why it's so sensitive, because this, this periodicity is two times 10 to the minus 15 Tesla meter square. So it's a very small flux is sufficient to really greatly change the properties of this structure. So what we do, we, we choose a working point here, we use feedback, and then we can measure any flux um, very accurately. So when we first uh, did this um, with uh, Sasha Usenko, um, we could detect the thermal motion of a resonator uh, that was set up in this way. And at one Kelvin, we have a lot more thermal motion than at 10 millikelvin. And also the Q is a little bit higher for this low temperature than for the higher, higher temperature. Um, and then what we did is uh, we lowered the temperature and measured the energy in this peak as a function of temperature. And this can be calibrated very accurately. Uh, and so we have a displacement sensitivity, which is quite good, and a force sensitivity, which is measured in Otto Newtons. And Otto comes from Otti, which is Danish, I guess, for 18. So it's 10 to the power minus 18 is the force that we, uh, 18, 10 to the minus 18 Newton is the force we teach. And that is the gravity which a mosquito exerts on a human being when the mosquito is at 100 meters distance. Yeah? So that is uh, um, motivating me to maybe go into gravity experiments uh, in the future. Um, so our, our best force noise is 0.3 up from here. And I'll, I'll come back to that later. And, and what we then do for, our, for a living, uh, Andrea uh, uh, did, that, did a, this experiment, we radiate three and a half gigahertz or 1.25 gigahertz, and we remove some of the magnetization from our sample. If this magnetization is gone, then um, we have a change in the resonance frequency of the cantilever, and then after a while, this magnetization is restored again. So we do all kinds of uh, magnetic experiments. Okay, um, and, and this is what it looks like. We have a little pot, which is, uh, it looks gold, but it's, uh, it has a superconducting coating on the inside. We have motors in order to tilt a plane and, and move it up and down. And then we can put this force sensor that you see sticking out here exactly where we want it on some sample with an RF wire and with the magnetic sample of interest. And here uh, we placed it just above a squid, a gradiometric squid that was made uh, by the PCB. Um, and um, okay, that, that is what we do. Now I show a, a picture of a, a colleague of mine, uh, Dirk Baumeister, um, who proposed a very audacious experiment more than 10 years ago. Um, and he said, okay, what I will do is I will take a mirror, shine light, do an interferometry, and we will be able to detect whether or not this mirror, mirror can be in a superposition. So this is actually preceding the um, the 
experiment that I referred to earlier with the piezoelectric thing that was brought into the superposition. So he started a, a complete field, and that also inspired me to see whether my experiment can also be used to do um, superposition experiments. So we would like to try to make these uh, superpositions uh, heavier. Um, and this is uh, the idea. Um, we, in diamond, there are some spins that are very, very coherent. They're called nitrogen vacancy uh, centers. Um, they can be coherent for 200 milliseconds, or 15 milliseconds. So the, that's the T2 time of these spins. The T1 time can be hours. This is uh, what our setup looks like. This is now a larger fridge. Um, the fridge, actually, that I share together with Dirk Baumeister, so we, uh, we have uh, space here for three different experiments. I have two and he has one. Um, and the nice thing for the PhD students is that they, uh, they share the suffering of getting this machine uh, to work. Um, by the time it works, they're no longer so happy because then they have to wait for their colleague to finish their experiment because they, before they can heat up the experiment and, and, and change something broken, for example, it's not so nice to have to wait for a colleague to finish their experiment. Um, here you see again these rotating uh, motors that uh, uh, allow us to move uh, the force sensor with respect to the diamond. And this one is nice because it, uh, you can fit two on top of each other. So what we will have on the bottom is a fiber that can look uh, at, the di at the diamond. Um, and then the magnetometry that an optical experiment does on the NV center will tell us where the force sensor is res with respect to the NV center. And um, then the MRFM will also be able to measure the same NV center that is studied optically. Uh, that's the idea. Right now, we only have the MRFM part ready, and we have done our first experiment on diamond with this setup. Um, and then I will sketch what this experiment would look like. Because in our best experiments where we have the best displacement uh, noise sensitivity, we put the cantilever right over a squid. So for the ultimate experiment, we will make a squid on top of the diamond right where we have an MV center. And then um, we can detect the thermal motion of our uh, and these center, oh, sorry, the thermal vo motion of our force sensor. Sorry, it's very early for me. Um, and then, if you can see the motion, you can also counteract the motion. So, what is done here is you take out the energy, and here um, the energy that is left is much, much less than the thermal motion. So, the thermal motion here started at 100 millikelvin, you can also start at 25 millikelvin. Um, but then if we take out the only energy, we had only 0.16 millikelvin of motion left, about 700 phonons. Um, so that means uh, that the, we have a displacement noise of three picometers if we give ourselves 10 milliseconds of time to detect the motion. Um, so what this means is we can drive this resonator and then we can switch on the cooling um, by this feedback system. You measure the motion, you phase shift it, and you drive the piezo to take out the motion. So this is the normal thermal motion on top of uh, a driving, and this would be the cool thermal motion on top of the driving. Then you can ask yourself, okay, now we have the squid on, we can measure its motion, we can remove the motion, then we switch off the squid because we don't want to do a measurement uh, anymore. And then we stop driving it and we just see what happens. And gradually uh, the amplitude will decrease and the thermal motion will increase again. So we can calculate with the setup that we have now how much time we have. So we, uh, we see that when we do it in this way, we have 100 milliseconds and during that time, 
there will be a little bit of extra thermal motion, just a few picometers again. Um, so then um, we can ask if we bring our force sensor close to an NV diamond, how much difference does it make to the motion? So if the spin is uh, attractive, then um, the, this, so I, this is the magnet on the mechanical force sensor, this is the spin, if they attract, then the resonance frequency will be a little bit slower than if they repel. So the idea is if I have um, a situation in which I have repulsion and attraction simultaneously because the spin is in the superposition of states, then these two um, copies will run out of phase. And within, um, if we let that happen for 100 milliseconds while the drive, the original motion was 10 nanometers, which is a reasonable amplitude, then uh, the separation would be larger than the thermal motion that it has acquired. Um, and then we could uh, do something else. We could do a pi pulse, and then um, the, the slow copy here will, and, and, uh, and the fast copy of the mechanical resonator, they will actually switch uh, places. If, if I do a pi pulse, I can uh, invert the spin. And this has to be done within the T2 time of the spin. So this is still, um, and, and then we can let it evolve more, and we can, and this will be our interferometry experiment. Um, and I, I think this is uh, nice because uh, we only have to give two RF pulses. So in, in, this can be done at very low power, um, and therefore at very low temperature. This brings me to an estimate of, 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 I want to estimate, I want to know whether this experiment with just 10 picometer motion will be enough to, um, to really expect a collapse of the wave function. So if um, um, we say, okay, Penrose had a very smart idea, he also had some other very smart ideas, it's a very creative person, so he, uh, uh, made this impossible triangle and then this impossible staircase where you can imagine someone walking up the stairs meeting someone who walks down the stairs. And you may know the Dutch uh, artist Escher. Um, the story is that Escher had an exposition in Amsterdam where Penrose was with his father. Then they both went home and they started to draw. So this is something that Penrose created together with his father. After seeing Escher's uh, um, uh, engravings, and then they sent this idea to Escher, and he made a beautiful uh, uh, rendering later. He also made the the aperiodic tilings. You can have a beautiful bathroom floor, which does not repeat itself. And uh, so, I think he has a lot of nice ideas in in geometry. And here, this is another idea of his, where if you say, if I have a mass in one place, then I can draw the gravitational field near this mass. But now, if this mass is in two places at the same time, then um, the two force fields are uh, shifted. So you can ask yourself, if, if I'm a test mass and I sit here, do I feel the purple or the blue force? Do I feel the force due to uh, the left or the, due to the right mass? And um, Penrose's point is that the masses themselves will be confused also. Um, and then the question is, can we put a number to that? And the way that Penrose answers this is, okay, how do I go from vectors to a number? Yeah, so I have a space filled with two vectors, how do I put a number to that? And, and, okay, what do you do with vectors if you want to convert them to a number? You take the inner product of the, of the vector and you integrate over space. So this is the difference between the two vectors um, squared and integrated over space. And if you then manipulate uh, this, you can go from the force field to um, uh, two densities, or you can go 
to the gravitational potential difference and the difference in mass density. So that, that is how he rewrote this, um, um, this attempt to put a number to how seriously wrong is uh, our situation if we have a massive object in two places at the same time. Well, I was very excited. He came and visited uh, Leiden. He was a visiting professor uh, with us. We discussed a lot. I taught his son how to weld. So I was uh, double uh, proud that I at least did my effort to turn his son into an experimental physicist rather than a theorist. Um, so this energy that he calculates, this number, can then be uh, converted to a collapse time because energy can be converted to time if you have something with units energy times time. So, yeah. So I must be honest, more honest than I usually am. Um, I am looking for a reason for the collapse. So. If I find something that is not incorporated, incorporated in standard quantum mechanics, I'm very happy because it provides me a little loophole that um, you know, maybe there is a possibility that a theoretical argument will lead to collapse. So the fact that we cannot describe two gravitational potentials simultaneously is, I hope it's the loophole that allows me to do some wishy-washy arm waving, and then out comes collapse. But that is, when I uh, presented this to my theory colleagues, I spent one and a half years talking to a string theorist to convince him that there is a problem. And after a lot of discussions, he said, ah, now I, I see the problem. Perhaps someone should work on it. Because the way string theorists approach the problem of gravity and quantum mechanics is they say, wait, you know, we go to very high energy, we make very small particles, then this length will be so small and the energy density will be so large that we will get a black hole. And I say, it's okay, you can work on this black hole stuff later, but try to answer if I have something heavy, like the dial of uh, a current measurement, can it be in two places? Because that's what I am working on. No one will build a particle accelerator at the Planck scale for a while. I will be working for the next 20 years on this experiment. So then I tried to explain, or and, and, and this is one of the theorists. He tried to take this Penrose um, energy. He fidgets an eye. He, he, he by hand puts in something that is uh, uh, non-unitary, and then he recovers Born's rule. So he said, if I do a wave packet 50% this, 50% this, I let it evolve over time with this wave function, I call it the Van Wezel Schrodinger equation, or if you're English, maybe you would say Van Wetzel Schrodinger equation. Um, if he lets this thing evolve on this wave function, then sometimes it goes this way, sometimes it goes the other way, because this is a, a stochastic variable, um, but it reproduces Born's rule. And, and that is something I like very much. It gives me what I measure. Yeah, I, but it's so, sort of ad hoc, this I is ad hoc, but this energy is the Penrose uh, energy. I try to think, and, and I try to explain it to others why this is an exciting idea and what is going on here. And the way I now uh, try to explain why we have a product of gravitational field and uh, density is in the following way. I say, imagine you have a clock and you have a gravitational potential that's in a superposition, so you have two gravitational potentials. Uh, what would happen to the time evolution? So this is uh, my drawing. I can do a little bit of general relativity, but only in spherical coordinates. Otherwise, it becomes too complicated. So I choose a sphere that has a certain mass, but I can I can give it two different radii, radius A or radius B. If you would put it, make it this into a clock, you would have two mirrors, you send in a pulse, and it oscillates like this, and out come little pulses. Then the time dilation 
will cause the, the pulses that come out if the sphere is small to be more separated than the pulses that come out when the sphere is large. Okay? So if you have a, a deeper potential, then the pulses will be delayed more. That is something I know. It's something that was measured in the 60s by sending light past the sun, let it reflect off of Venus, and then the light comes back to Earth. And there's a delay because of the gravitational potential of the sun. That's called the Shapiro effect. Um, and now the question is, how does that play out for a sphere? So if I would ask this nucleus, say, say pick a nucleus here, and um, the nucleus is part of both spheres, because the, the, it's a superposition of radii, um, but it doesn't know which uh, potential to choose. Should I choose the time dilatation that belongs to this or to that potential, or somewhere in between? And if you do that, if you say, I've stayed one with one radius that evolves under this time, or under, and, and the radius that is larger should evolve under a different time. It's very difficult to figure out. Um, and I say, okay, if that is where the problem is, that the nuclei do not know how fast their little clocks uh, should tick, then I can go a little bit further. So, and then there's also the question of the energy. And I, um, so what I now say is I, I have a state with radius A, and I have all the different nuclei, and it's a product of all the different time evolutions of all the different nuclei, which all have their own clock. And for the energy, I choose um, the mc squared, the rest mass of the nucleus. And then um, appears what we, uh, well, how I understand Penrose uh, nowadays, is each nucleus has their own clock. They all have an energy, which is their rest mass. Um, and then I will express how badly I don't know their time. So the confusion that the clocks have, I try to put a number to that time ambiguity. Um, so the time is given um, anywhere that is determined by this potential. And it could be anywhere between this time, given by the potential when the radius is A, or this time when the potential is given by radius B. But it can be anywhere in between. And then I have my potential <coughs> and I have my mass. So this, um, this product leads to a sum of masses and this then can be written as an integral. Except I don't know what I should write down. But there's one, uh, so I can just say I do uh, the product of the density with the potential. I can also uh, do the density times the difference of the two um, uh, potentials. Um, the, what Penrose does, he takes the differences of the potential times the differences in the density. So his uh, energy, I view as a particular way of expressing uh, this time ambiguity. And this, this phase difference or the phase ambiguity, it grows with time. And the way to convert it from uh, a phase to a collapse time, which I, I mean, I call it collapse time even though I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know what will happen. I hope it will collapse because that's what I see happens and I have no explanation for. Um, and, and then I say, okay, by the time this, this phase uh, confusion reaches 2 pi, that will be the time at which the experiment collapses. And um, so, so that is how I explain to myself and to others what is going on. And when I explain it in this way to my string theory colleagues, that was the moment when he said, ooh, we have a problem that we didn't realize we have. And, and uh, I hope um, uh, he and his colleagues will work on this more and that they will tell me whether I can expect collapse or whether it's just another form of decoherence. But I'm, I'm looking for collapse, not for decoherence. Um, so now I have uh, discussed, these are the theorists I, I like 
you'd like to talk to to develop these ideas, this is my group that has been uh, working on these uh, uh, mechanical resonator experiments. Uh, Andrea was there from the beginning, but then he added a new thing. He met uh, uh, Bassi. Is he here? Okay. Yeah. Well, nice to meet you. I hope to talk to you more. Um, we have a paper together. And we only wrote by email uh, a little bit back and forth. So I'm very happy with Andrea. He got the experiments in my lab uh, to work very well. And then he came with this extra. And um, so he, he uh, showed this work uh, last week um, where in the continuous spontaneous localization model, there are two parameters. One is a rate of collapse and, and one is a coherence length. Um, so what you have, you have a cantilever. If it has a large area, then it will be, uh, it will be measured or it will collapse more often. It's, uh, the way I understand it is just an ad hoc uh, uh, assumption. Um, but what happens if a cantilever is in a potential and it's in a waveform, whenever it collapses, it collapses to a particular position and that will cause it to gradually warm up. Of course, it will lose its heat to the environment. This rate should be very low, very modest, otherwise the universe would start boiling, uh, which we don't know, we don't want that to happen. Um, so this rate has to be low and you can put a, a limit on what this number can be, otherwise the universe would start boiling. But you can also try to put a number on this rate by measuring the temperature of uh, our, our force sensor, uh, which is something we did earlier. So this is uh, a way of recycling uh, data. Because this was the data that I showed earlier to show that uh, our mechanical resonator can be cooled to 25 millikelvin. So, and, and what uh, Andrea and my colleague Bossi uh, did was to uh, look at this uh, here carefully and, and say, okay, this is a straight line, but it does not go through the origin. So there is a little offset in temperature, um, which I would say is not really real, but it is uh, at least an upper bound to these parameters in the collapse model. So this was this orange curve, and it was a a, a better bound than previous experiments. Um, now, um, this is a new experiment which um, uh, Andrea did in, in Italy, where he again sees that it does not go through the origin. It's a more careful experiment with a larger magnet here, and um, he has checked uh, how good the vibration isolation is, how quiet the magnetic environment is, and this is the problem of, um, it's the difference between a negative result and a positive result, yeah? If this uh, um, thing goes through the origin more accurately, we will, we will be able to lower this line and maybe the line will come here. But Andrea cannot, and I have also looked at this, we cannot come up with a reason why this would not go to zero. There's no experimental little thing that uh, should cause this. Um, it means perhaps that we are poor experimenters, that we cannot come up with uh, tricky things that spoil our experiments. Um, so we'll just have to keep trying. Um, and, and one of the things is we have cantilevers which have uh, this same upper bound already at much higher temperatures. So, uh, and th these are cantilevers from Christian Dagen uh, uh, in, in Zurich. So uh, we collaborate and I have asked him, can I use your cantilevers in my refrigerator? And maybe then we can lower this line. Or if all the lines bunch up together here, then it, it starts to be, become scary, right? If it's no longer a coincidence, if all the lines are stuck here. Yeah, so, um, yeah, towards the end, I have a picture where I have this um, 
resonator, and we cooled it down to five millikelvin. Uh, while, uh, um, and, and um, the best cantilevers in the world are made by uh, Christian Dagen, and they're made out of diamond, and they're very difficult to make. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we can do this experiment soon. Um, and then I want to briefly mention uh, the, the project which Tom is presenting this afternoon, um, where, I mean, we go through all this trouble of making a very, very heavy superposition, hoping that if we get these superpositions to work, we can get an interferometry signal, and then maybe we can find out when this stops being uh, a quantum experiment, when it stops to being. So that's coming from one end, trying first to do a very difficult experiment, and then hoping you can find out where the quantum collapse takes place. We can also come from the other side. It's a very simple experiment. It's just a photo detector. You send one photon and it says, click, you know. And that's a very, very clear collapse of the wave function. So what I uh, already with uh, Penrose, when he was visiting me in 2010, I said, can't we come from the other side, make a photo detector simpler and simpler, make a photo detector smaller and smaller, and hope that we can do an experiment in which we uh, dissect a photo detector until it's so simple that we can understand it. And, and this is my best attempt uh, so far. Um, we take a single photon at gigahertz frequency, we send it through two transmission lines, and then we have an amplifier. Because we know quite well how to amplify uh, gigahertz photons. Actually, Tom will explain how difficult it is because, of course, I can say it's simple. I think, Tom, you will show this, right? Oh, you won't. The thing, <laughs> the thing I want to point out is that if you do an experiment at 10 millikelvin, um, 10 millikelvin is the equivalent of 200 megahertz, then you can send a photon of uh, 6 gigahertz in a superconducting material which has a gap which is maybe 100 gigahertz. So you can have this separation of scales. Superconductivity is well understood if you stay away in your energy scale from this gap. And, and, and this we can do in between. And then the idea is you take a transmission line, so the signal meanders like this, but the transmission line has these little Josephson junctions here. Here you see a, this is the Josephson junction. And then it will be covered with uh, a tunnel such that we have large capacitance and large inductance per unit length. And then this will be 50 ohm matched, and it will be a beautiful amplifier. So you, what you do is you, you pump it with a, a carrier wave, and then your signal is amplified. Um, and then we hope that as we turn up this gain, we will continue to see this uh, uh, interference signal that you get. But when the gain is really, really high, then we expect collapse. And we can look at the electrons that are moving back and forth the gravitational potential that the, gra that the electrons make, and that will help us to uh, determine whether this collapse in these detectors or in these amplifiers, eh, they can be tuned from an amplifier when everything is coherent and quantum mechanical to a detector which collapses the wave function. That is the idea. Um, and then what I would think would be really great, if you have about if you have 100 or 10,000 photons running here, and you have a tiny amount of dissipation, you should still see the interference. But having a very small amount of dissipation would already cause this little piece of gold that I've drawn there to go from 10 millikelvin to 11 millikelvin, which I think is very funny, that I would create a superposition of two different temperatures which is kind of strange, that you take something that is quantum and you take something that is um, statistical physics. And, and, and that is uh, what I'm excited about because that's also the ADS-CFT correspondence, anti-de-Sitter conformal field theory correspondence. That is also a statistical physics and a quantum physics uh, correspondence. So I, I like that. I have no time to talk about the Led Zeppelin, which is our levitation experiment 
where we have thick modes of a resonator and all of their cross terms. Um, that is uh, my little piece of lead, which is good for a gravitational experiment. And I would like to point out this was inspired by something that Josie, who is also here, um, he uh, um, postulated that perhaps gravitation comes with a delay. And I think if we can measure gravitation with very small masses, we can also measure this delay. Um, but this is very hampered. This, these signals um, are not thermal. They are excited by external mechanical vibrations. And that is something we try to solve with big steel structures. Um, oh, and, and this is the less than one, less than 10 millikelvin work. So here, um, this is the mechanical resonator that Andrea presented. He could cool it down to 20 millikelvin. We went down to five millikelvin, and it continues to have a Q, but it was contaminated between this experiment and that. So we have, we hope to go, see the damping go down all the way to here, but there was something else in parallel causing this experiment. But uh, oh, it's telling me that I should pay money to Microsoft. Um, otherwise, I cannot continue my talk. But uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, um, thank you very much for this nice talk. Um, I think you can safely go home and <clears throat> tell your kids that you did a great job very early in the morning. Okay, no, it's up to you. Questions? Hi, yeah, uh, great talk, very interesting. So, um, a question regarding your, this idea of dissecting the, the photo detector. Yeah. So, uh, usually, so the photo detector takes a photo and then amplifies, but what you're doing is you're putting two amplifiers on a quantum, let's say, superposition or entangled state. And aren't you cloning, aren't you cloning the quantum state by, by putting the amplifiers uh, there? I mean, that, of course it would collapse. I mean, you're not allowed yeah. to do that. So, so uh, Tom will talk about that in great detail, that if you amplify a single photon, um, with a parametric amplifier, you actually get a distribution of photon numbers. And then you can have one distribution of photon numbers interfere with another distribution coming from the other arm. So it's, it's not uh, an attempt to violate the no-cloning principle. But um, the, a single photon, if, if you know how long the photon is, say it's uh, 10 nanoseconds long, meaning that it's maybe 30 centimeters long, something like that. Um, um, you can say which electric fields I need between the inner and the outer conductor. And then you know how many electrons are, have to move in order to create this electric field. These electrons, of course, carry mass, and they will create a superposition of space-time in the same way as, as the objects will. So then, if these electrons uh, are creating this superposition of space times, I think that is where it might go wrong. And, and you know, if you have huge gravitational potentials because you amplify a photon, then obviously something has to change in quantum mechanics. And I'm postulating or hoping that before I uh, retire, we we do something in this area, something experimental. I was also worrying about your your scheme of amplification. Wouldn't the the system uh, in which the amplification takes place lose energy when the photon manages to extract the photons and therefore cause the coherence between that branch and the other branch that you want to superpose? Yeah, so um, the, the energy comes from the pump. So you, you pump the transmission line and then one photon from the pump, uh, or, or two photons from the pump can be converted into an extra signal photon and an idler photon. And, and um, you would have to look at this as the um, entangled state uh, between the pump 
and the signal both. Yeah, yeah, but this, yeah. So, so this this uh, entanglement, um, uh, there is information that leaks away, but you can exactly calculate what visibility you expect. So the visibility does go down as you go to higher gain. But then I would be giving Tom's talk. Yeah. Hello. Can you please go back to the slide where you showed that modified Schrodinger equation with that Penrose contribution? Yes. You had that Schrodinger equation yeah, modified. Yeah. Work on the plane. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh. So there, uh, so from, from, from the Penrose idea, you get the other term and you add that parameter G, no? That parameter oh, I. Oh, so, so this is the Penrose energy. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. And there are two things added a noise term uh. in order to have the stochastic, uh, as sometimes it collapses here, sometimes yeah. it collapses to the other state. That comes from the noise term. But that one uh, state goes down and one state goes up, so this one grows at the expense of this state, yeah. that is given by this factor i. So there are two terms, i that is coming from i that growing and, and the contribution from the noise, which together contribute to the collapse. That's yeah, together idea. they make the uh, Born's rule happen. So you... This is how we write the time evolution. If this H contains an I, then there will be something that has I squared, so it, it, it decays with time. And the stochastic that part end. in H. So that end, but the main question, so the collapse time you calculate, or you talk about the collapse, that is actually determined by the noise yeah. and the I. So you choose the noise amplitude such that you get the Penrose collapse time. Collapse. Because, because what in this, what, what Jasper van Wezel tried to find was a mathematical formalism that uh, captures the different ingredients that a future theory will need. It has to be stochastic, it has to give Born's rule, and it would be nice if something um, reflects the gravitational nature of the state. It's well known in the yeah, future yeah. and that's not the right equation. Okay, so I, I think we can maybe discuss this in the, in the break. To meet, uh, yes. that's why I came. <laughs> okay, so, yes. It,